The United States Air Force new fighter jet is currently called the Next Generation Air Dominance Program, and it has the primary goal to eventually replace the F-22 Raptor. Specifically, the NGAD aims to address shortfalls in the operational needs found in the Pacific Theater. Currently, U.S. Air Force fighters lack sufficient range and payload required in the Pacific, and we'll see how the NGAD goes about addressing that. What type of weapons and sensor capabilities is the NGAD likely to have? How does the U.S. Air Force think the future of contested airspace battles will play out? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Let's find out. The Air Force plans to acquire 200 NGAD jets and 1,000 of its unmanned companion wingmen, and it'll come in at a price tag of about $16 billion. That amount will be spent over the next five years on its development. The Air Force claims this major investment is worth it though because this fighter will lower the cost per flying hour and make it more sustainable in the long term. And the money will be necessary to develop the capability before other countries are able to. China, Russia, and the United States all claim that they have a similar timeline for their sixth generation aircraft. They want it finished by 2030, then in actual operation by 2035, and they hope to completely replace their fifth generation aircraft by 2040. So set a reminder for my video update for September 2040. In July, we might have gotten our very first look at the silhouette of the NGAD from Lockheed Martin when they posted an Instagram story with several of their iconic designs, followed by a mysterious final airframe that experts believe is the sixth generation fighter. I guess it's better to disclose it before someone has a chance to accidentally post a photo of the model, like how Russia did with their 6th generation fighter. What ultimately will bring the NGAD fighter into the 6th generation will be a combination of what the Air Force Chief of Staff General David Goldfein calls five key technologies, which are roughly outlined in a 2022 congressional report. Those being adaptive cycle engines, new airframe materials focusing on stealth and thermal management, improve radar and tracking systems with a focus on external cameras to provide increased situational awareness, and the last two being some of the coolest, albeit scary developments, accompanied unmanned drones and directed energy countermeasures. But first, I wanna tell you about this video sponsor, National University. One of the biggest benefits we receive for our military service is our GI Bill, and National University is one of the best places to use it. Founded by a retired Navy captain in 1971, NU has been serving the military community for over 50 years. Not only do they know how to fully maximize the post 9-11 GI Bill, they're a yellow ribbon university, and NU offers 25% off tuition scholarships for military military veterans. They offer an on-site and online convenient four and eight week courses for bachelor's, master's, and doctorate programs. Plus, they give credit for military experience. With over 190 degrees plus certificates and credentials, their military advising team will provide career-focused guidance and dedicated support to help determine your best path forward. Whether you're thinking about getting your bachelor's, master's, or doctorate for your post-military career, National University has the tools and experienced staff to guide you along the way. Simply click the link in the description or pin comment below to learn more about National University today. The effort to develop the aircraft began in 2014 after the publication of the Air Dominance Initiative by DARPA. It concluded that in order for an aircraft to have a decisive technological advantage by the 2030s, quote, no single new technology or platform could deter and defeat the sophisticated and numerous adversary of systems under development. There's no single capability that provides a silver bullet solution. This means in order to have air dominance, you'd have to have an entirely new generation of aircraft and supporting systems, not just one new kind of radar, avionics upgrade, or munition, but rather an entire suite of new technologies. And just like that, the next generation air dominance program was born. Each of the NGAD's unique capabilities are designed to ensure a strategic edge against America's near-peer adversaries. The Pentagon never states who exactly they mean by near-peer adversaries, so I always just assume they mean Canada. Those polite folks up north who've been secretly building a formidable air force right on our border, they think we don't notice them. The Air Force focused on a design known as the Penetrating Counter Air, or PCA platform. This is one of the key concepts to understand that might be incorporated in the NGAD program. If the NGAD follows the PCA theory, it'll be supported by Uncrewed Collaborative Combat Aircraft, or CCAs, 
which are loyal wingman platforms. These are drones and UAVs that team up with the NGAD aircraft. Whoa, that's a lot of acronyms in one breath. What's really going on here? The loyal wingman is a military drone with an onboard AI control system and capability to carry and deliver a significant military weapons payload. These trusty sidekicks are the Robin to your NGAD Batman. It'll serve as the extra eyes, ears, and missile launchers. The NGAD is a program that seeks to change how the air battle is fought. And the leading proponent of this change is to use the Collaborative Combat Aircraft, or CCAs, with the goal of operational introduction around the year 2030. These drones are designed to serve a number of purposes, as well as being just as endurable and efficient as the planes they're accompanying. The primary use of these CCAs will be in the air-to-air -air realm, carrying additional sensor packages and targeting abilities while also holding their own air-to-air -air munitions. This spreads out the operational load of capabilities between three rather than a single manned aircraft. Stealth fighters, due to the need to store missiles within internal weapons bays, have relatively limited payload capacities compared to older fourth generation aircraft, and this additional capacity with CCAs will enable sorties to possibly double the munitions that they would have been able to carry otherwise. Additionally, these unmanned escorts will carry their own targeting package, able to feed information between not only the aircraft they're escorting, but also across all targeting platforms, meaning a CCA would be able to spot a target and enable any available aircraft to strike if they were within range. The unmanned nature of the drones also allows for greater risk to be conducted in air combat. Rather than a pilot and sixth generation fighter putting themselves at risk to engage an aerial target, the drone could be the one to engage it, with the pilot remaining outside the range of anything able to engage them. It's a lot easier to replace an unmanned drone than the aircraft pilot who takes years to train. So these 1,000 CCAs that are scheduled for production means that the Air Force plans to attach drone pairs to 300 F-35s currently in service and 200 of the new NGAD fighters. Reports indicate due to technological limitations of artificial intelligence, we likely won't see these unmanned systems in air-to-ground engagements just yet due to the much higher level of complexity inherent with that domain. Once they're able to hit ground targets, this will be especially crucial in seed missions. The AI system is envisioned as being significantly lighter and lower cost than a human pilot, with their associated life support systems. Wait, could this thing explain all those recent UFO sighting around the world? Is the UFO story just a counterintelligence psyop to cover for this unmanned aircraft's capabilities? Either way, the primary application of these drones is to elevate the role of human pilots to mission commanders. This leaves the AI as loyal wingmen, to operate under their tactical control. The idea of this UAV wingman is it can perform the tasks that you don't want to worry about, like scanning for targets. General Kenneth Wilspatch is the commander of the Pacific Air Force Fleet, and he gives us some insider knowledge on what the drone tactics are going to be. Quote, some of them will be high-end, and some will be attritable, and some of them, we just plan on them getting shot, because that's their purpose. To get out there and soak up munitions that can't be used on something else. Oh, that last part I understand because that was my job in the infantry. It's a concept known as affordable mass, where a thousand unmanned drones will keep the enemy guessing if they have enough ammunition to engage all their targets. The affordable mass idea will only cost the Air Force $6 billion to give you an idea of what the Air Force considers affordable. They live in a different reality with their nice chow halls and their luxury hotels during training events. I joined the wrong branch. Based on statements from the Air Force and their new Pacific Air Force's strategy 2030, the eventual mission of these drones and sixth generation fighters will be to target China's long range rocket forces, likely because they represent the greatest threat to aircraft while they're vulnerable on the ground at bases or on aircraft carriers. The goal of the PCA was to solve a problem that has plagued both the F-22 and F-35 aircraft, and that has to do with range. Due to the physics required to make an aircraft both highly maneuverable and stealthy, there are only a handful of geometric hull designs that work, which is a major reason why stealth fighters all seem to look the same. These design shapes greatly limit how much internal fuel an aircraft can carry, and things like external fuel tanks or mid-air refueling essentially negate any stealth that the aircraft would have, essentially taking away the entire point of having a fifth or sixth generation fighter to begin with. The F-22, for example, was designed with a European war in mind, where most sorties would be flown within a few hundred miles at most, and it had the luxury option of landing at the countless runways to be found in friendly NATO-aligned countries. But in a region such as the Pacific Theater, 
The distance between Taiwan and the nearest American accessible airbase, for example, would be at least 500 miles in Okinawa, just outside the F-22's combat radius with a full payload. The F-35, while it has a bit extra range and flexibility due to it being able to launch from a carrier, is not at its core an air supremacy aircraft, creating a capability gap in the United States' goal of total air superiority. The PCA looks to fill that gap, providing an airframe that's capable of long ranges under full payload while still retaining the ability to turn an enemy pilot into an amateur parachutist. It's easy to get lost focusing on the sixth generation airframe and hardware and forget that the sixth generation program includes more than just aircraft. It's also part of a larger strategy. And that main thrust of the strategy is new remote islands. The Air Force is buying up every remote island except for Little St. James. The war zone first spotted a hidden American airbase under construction at Tinian Island in the Pacific. It's actually an old B-29 bomber airfield dating back to World War II that has since become overgrown with thick jungle vegetation. This is going to be one of the locations of this infamous Agile Combat Employment Base, or ACE Base. The theory is that the ACE Base will basically be a bare-bones skeleton crew of mechanics. It's a gasoline and repair shop in the middle of nowhere. The idea here is you can deploy just a handful of NGAD fighters and one refueling aircraft and start running sorties within 24 hours. Agile Combat Employment Base sounds exactly like what you think it is. When your boss told you you were switching to new Agile Office Space, this is the same idea. This ties perfectly into America's larger strategy for how they plan on defending the Pacific. The whole idea is based around having these assets forward located. Since we know the F-22 has a unique advantage of operating at altitudes in excess of 60,000 feet, there's speculation that the NGAD will have similar capabilities. Any higher than that would require you have a full pressure suit for your air crew. The advantage of high altitude flight is it gives air-to-air -air missiles and even air-to-ground missiles the ability to fly much further than when launched at a more reasonable altitude of 40,000 feet. The war zone run by Tyler Rodgeway pointed out this insight, that even though stealth aircraft are tough to spot, the ability to sneak through enemy air defense networks is not going to be an option all the time. This means flying at high altitude will be important for a next generation fighter to have the maximum standoff capability with their weapons. For example, if an NGAD fighter is operating at 60,000 feet, its loyal wingman UAV Goose could be flying at 80,000 feet as a communication node. That means it can stay connected while being nearly 750 miles away from each other. The Air Force has already handed out five contracts to different companies worth $1 billion to work on the NGAD. Part of these contracts is going to develop the next generation adaptive propulsion. Starting with adaptive cycle engines, this is a new engineering technique that looks to increase the efficiency and therefore range of the aircraft. In typical aircraft design, engines needed to be produced with a specific speed in mind in order to be at its highest efficiency and not run out of fuel. Essentially, in the past, you had to decide between fuel-efficient long-range cruising or higher maneuverability and performance, but greater fuel consumption. Adaptive cycle engines are looking to solve this problem using multiple fans and air intake methods in order to optimize output for a given situation meaning the engines will operate differently when taking off and reaching a cruising altitude, then change over again at supersonic cruising, and even again when more maneuverability is needed when engaged with a target. This is the primary way that the NGAD fighter seeks to extend its combat range while maintaining stealth entirely using its internal fuel tanks. Not only that, but it would be able to provide more accessory power, which would allow for greater avionics cooling. This new sixth generation fighter will host a series of designs and technologies not seen yet in many fighters. Most notably, its distinct lack of vertical tails, similar to the B-2 and B-21 Raider hulls. Vertical tails, while greatly increasing the stability and maneuverability of an aircraft, similarly increase the radar cross-section and air drag of the plane. In order to combat this, the new design will utilize the latest improvements in thrust vectoring and hull-oriented control services, rather than relying on traditional aeronautic designs. A second distinct design feature will be the double delta wing design, which enables better handling at both high and low speeds. A high sweep angle of the front of the fuselage around the cockpit reduces air drag, while a low sweep angle of the wings increases maneuverability 
This, combined with the lack of tail, creates an airframe that would have been near impossible to fly effectively as a fighter in previous generations. But advances in avionics and computer capabilities have allowed engineers to not have to make the compromises on speed and range seen on previous aircraft. In addition to ensuring speed and maneuverability in the NGAD fighter, it's also going to incorporate shrouded engine exhaust in order to reduce infrared heat signature. And the latest generation of RAM, or radar absorbing materials, this new RAM coating are currently under development on F-22 testbed platforms, which have already been spotted sporting mirror chrome-like finishings over the past couple of years. While we don't know what the eventual finish of the coating will actually look like, I'm not entirely against the sick paint job like that, but I'm not going to be satisfied until I can paint some speed flames on the side. Latest renderings of the NGAD show small or even barely existent cockpit views, all in an effort to increase aerodynamics and reduce radar signatures at the cost of the pilot being able to physically see their surroundings. Not something that's been implemented in a fighter design to date. To counter this, the NGAD will utilize electro-optical sensors, the DoD's fancy way of saying a series of cameras that will allow pilots to have a full 360 degree view around the aircraft. Not only is it simply allowing them to see what's around them, but it integrates targeting data, allowing the NGAD to engage targets at any angle from any distance it can track. That said, I'm not sure if I'd be able to handle the motion sickness that comes with dogfighting when you can see your own torso. Now to get into the real stuff, the NGAD from its inception was designed with directed energy weapons in mind an area of development that the United States military has been pushing for some time now. The idea is that, compared to conventional munitions, lasers or directed microwaves are near infinitely cheaper than guided missiles, costing a few dollars at most to fire at laser weapons, rather than sometimes millions of bucks that go into guided explosives. This directed energy laser weapon effort in development is tied to the Air Force Self-Protect High Energy Laser Demonstrator Program, or SHIELD for short. Very clever Air Force, very clever. I'm sure somewhere there's a very proud Lieutenant Colonel for coming up with that one. As of now, the primary purpose of these directed energy weapons will be in a defensive role, eliminating missiles in the air as opposed to relying on conventional countermeasures such as flares or jamming, which may or may not work in defeating the guidance system of a modern incoming round. Unfortunately for DARPA, they've yet to find a way to outsmart the first law of thermodynamics as far as I know, and the heat from a directed energy weapon has to go somewhere meaning that even if they were able to create a more powerful laser for offensive purposes, it would need to be integrated in a way that wouldn't signify to every IR detector center that America's latest and greatest fighter was in the area. In addition, lasers act entirely differently than a ballistic munition, in that anything that gets in the way of a beam is going to interfere with its effectiveness as a weapon system, and the further away a target is, the more spread out and, by extension, less powerful the laser will become. To put this into an overly exaggerated perspective, the tiny dot from a laser pointer that you would use to play with your cat would cover an area over 187 square miles if you pointed it at the moon. Originally, the NGAD was going to be part of this procurement cycle called the Century Series from the 1950s and 60s. It was dubbed this by the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, Will Roper. If they'd followed this idea, then fighter designs would be continually iterated to enable the rapid insertion of new technology and procured in small batches. This iterative improvement plan is somewhat happening because the F-22 has already been used to test NGAD technology and some advances are expected to be applied to the F-22. It's like when your PlayStation or Xbox is backwards compatible. Due to the complexity and sophistication of modern aircraft design though, the Digital Century series concept was eventually abandoned and it was replaced with a more traditional development and procurement approach. But I'm fairly certain that some viewers out there are experts in aviation and can tell us more about the 6th generation fighter. If you like this video, you found something useful in it, thank you for hitting the like and subscribe button. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. If you get a chance, check out one of these new videos, and I'll see you guys in a couple of days.